five. Prime Suspect by Linda Laplante. Prime Suspect. Chapter one. The first body. Mrs. Corinna Salbana opened her eyes and looked at the clock when she heard the noise. It was almost two a.m. Angrily, she went downstairs. As she passed Della Mornay's room, she noticed the light was on. That woman, she thought, she owes me rent. She brings men back to her room. Now she leaves the front door open in the middle of the night. She knocked hard on Della's door. Come on, open it, she shouted. I know you're in there. There was no reply. She pushed the door open. Della's room was as old and dirty as the other apartments in the house. It was untidy, clothes all over the place, and it smelled of cheap makeup. Blankets lay on the floor next to the bed. Come out of there right now, Mrs. Salbana cried. I want to speak to you. She pulled back one of the blankets. She opened her mouth to scream. But no sound came. Chief Detective Officer John Shefford was the last person to arrive at the house. Two police cars and an ambulance were already there. A group of curious neighbors stood near the gate. The policemen stood back when Shefford walked into the house. They all knew and respected him. At the bottom of the stairs, he stopped for a moment. He had investigated many murders in his time, but this one was different. He forced himself to go upstairs. Detective Officer Bill Otley was waiting for him. It's Della Mornay, boss, he said quietly. Inside the room, the police doctor was examining the body, and speaking into a tape machine. She's lying on her face. Her hands are tied behind her back. The doctor waved at Shefford and continued. A lot of blood on her head and face. Serious injuries to her shoulders and chest. She probably died about twelve thirty a.m. The doctor turned the body over. Shefford turned away. He could not look at her. She had been pretty. Now her face was destroyed. Her hair was covered in blood. One eye was completely gone. Her name's Della Mornay, Shefford said. She's a prostitute. I've seen her before. There was a small book lying under the bed. The doctor did not notice when Shefford picked it up and gave it to Otley without a word. Otley put the book in his pocket. He would do anything for Shefford. Seven years ago, when Otley's wife died, Shefford was the only person who understood his anger and sadness. Shefford was at the hospital the night Ellen died. He did everything he could to help. He was always there when Otley needed him. And in the months after Ellen's death. Otley spent a lot of time with Shefford and his family. Shefford was his friend, as well as his boss. He loved the man, admired him. Otley would do anything for him. All morning the investigation continued. The doctor continued to examine the body. She was killed with a small, sharp object, maybe a tool. She had sex with someone before she died. We can do DNA tests to find the blood type of the person who killed her. And something else. There are marks on her arms and wrists. She was tied. Policemen searched Della's apartment. The murderer had not stolen anything. Her jewelry and money were still there. All the prostitutes and call girls who knew Della were interviewed. No luck. 
Nobody had seen her for many weeks. They thought perhaps she had gone north to visit a friend, but they did not say who. At 11 a.m., Chief Detective Officer Jane Tennyson parked her car outside the police station. It was a cold, clear day, and she hurried to her office. For three months, she had worked on a financial case, and she was bored. She had moved to this police department to work on interesting cases, not to sit at a desk all day. Why is Shefford here? she asked police officer Maureen Havers. He's got a new investigation. A prostitute was murdered last night in Milner Road. How did Shefford get the case? Tennyson asked angrily. I thought he was on holiday. I was here until after ten last night. Maureen shook her head. I don't know. Tennyson wanted to shout with anger. For eighteen months she had waited for a murder case. But every time something happened, every time there was a murder case, it was given to one of the male officers. Murders were man's work, it seemed. She stormed out and banged the door behind her. Shefford received the message on his car radio that evening. DNA tests showed that Della Mornay had had sex with the same man who had attacked a woman in 1988. George Arthur Marlowe, in prison for 18 months, although he said he wasn't guilty, said he didn't even know the victim. He has the same DNA as the man who murdered Della. No question about it. He's our prime suspect, all right. Shefford drove straight back to the station to pick up the papers he needed to arrest Marlowe. Right, he said, putting on his coat again. Let's go and get him. Jane Tennyson opened the door of the small apartment she shared with her boyfriend, Peter Rawlings. They had lived together for three months now. Peter came out of the kitchen and smiled at her. Bad day? he asked. She nodded, walked through to the bedroom and threw her coat on the bed. Want to talk about it? Peter asked. Later, she said. Let me have a bath first. Jane and Peter had been friends for a long time before they started living together. Peter had been married and had a young son, Joey. When his marriage ended, he spent a long time talking to Jane about what had gone wrong. Over the months, they saw each other nearly every day and grew closer, until Jane suggested that Peter moved into her flat. Later, when they were eating dinner, she told him about her problems at the police station. He was a good listener, caring and thoughtful. She had become very fond of him, she realized with surprise. She told him about the way Shefford and the other men did not respect her. They think I'm a joke, she said angrily. My boss won't let me work on murder investigations. He tells me to be patient. Peter touched her hand. You'll get something soon. Shefford stood at the door of George Marlowe's house. Marlowe seemed amazed by the arrival of the police. He stood there, holding his cup of coffee, unable to understand what they wanted. I'm arresting you as a murder suspect. Moira, Marlowe's wife, came out. What do you want? Where are you taking him? she screamed. He hasn't had his dinner! The policemen did not reply. They led Marlowe out to the police car. Two officers began to search the house from top to bottom, looking for something that would prove that Marlowe had killed Della Mornay. Moira watched them. Her eyes were cold and hard. She hated policemen. Hated them. Jane lay in bed next to Peter. So what will you do? he asked. I'm not leaving. They may want me to leave, but I won't. One day I'll get a murder case, 
and then I'll show them how good I am. Peter sighed. Jane thought about her work all the time. It was the only thing she talked about. At the police station, George Marlowe was quiet but helpful. He asked to telephone his lawyer. Shefford prepared to question him. Okay, I'm ready. I know he's the killer, he told Otley. Let's get in there and make him admit it. He kicked open the door and walked into the room where Marlowe was waiting, his hands on his knees and his head down. Marlowe looked up, surprised. George, I'm Chief Detective Officer John Shefford, and this is Detective Officer Bill Ockley. We want to ask you a few questions before your lawyer gets here. OK? He smiled and offered Marlowe a cigarette. You smoke, George? No, sir. Good. Right. Can you tell me where you were on the night of January 13th? Take your time. January 13th? Saturday? That's easy. I was at home with Moira. We watched television. Yeah, I was with my wife. Where were you at about ten o'clock? I was at home. Oh, no. No. Wait a minute. I wasn't at home. Going to tell me where you were then, George? Marlowe smiled. I went out for a while. I met a girl. You know, a prostitute. Met her before, had you? Marlowe shook his head. No. It was the first time I'd seen her. She was outside the train station at Ladbrook Grove. I stopped and asked her how much. But you're sure you hadn't seen her before? Della Mornay. Della Mornay? Who's Della Mornay? asked Marlowe. Chapter 2 Interviews the interview continued throughout the day. After we had sex, I took her back to Ladbrook Grove and paid her, Marlowe said. The last time I saw her, she was looking into another car. A red, maybe a Sirocco. I'm not sure what type it was. I thought she'd found another customer. And then what did you do, George? I went home. What time was that? I can't remember. Ask Moira. Did you know the girl? I'd never seen her before. Like I said, she just came over to my car. Shefford showed him a photograph of Della Mornay. Come on, George. Shefford was impatient. Was this the girl? I can't remember. It was dark. In another room, Moira was asked the same questions again and again. What time did Marlowe come home? Did he go out again? She gave the same answers every time. Marlowe came home at 10.30. They watched television and went to bed. When the police let her go, Detective Officer Birkin was sent back to the house with her. He had orders to collect Marlowe's car, a brown Mark III Rover. He took two officers with him, and they drove Moira home. There was no sign of the Rover. It was not parked on the street near the house. Someone has probably stolen it, Moira said. I wouldn't be surprised if you took it yourselves. It was 11.30 p.m., when Shefford stopped asking Marlowe questions. He had twenty-four hours to find evidence that connected Marlowe with the murder. If he couldn't find a link, he would have to let Marlowe go home. Find Marlowe's car, he told Birkin. I want to search it. Next morning, Shefford sat at his desk 
looking through the notes on the case. Otley brought him a cup of coffee. Did Birkin find the car? No, Otley said. It isn't parked near the house. Moira says it must have been stolen. Find it. And Otley, check something for me, will you? There was a girl murdered in Oldham when I worked there. Bring me the information on her. Do you think Marlowe murdered her as well? Maybe. I want to check it out. Otley pulled Della Morney's diary out of his pocket. What shall I do with this? Keep it. I'll look through it later. I'm going to see the boss and tell him what has happened. Jane Tennyson arrived at work soon after Shefford. His car was badly parked, so it was difficult to find space for her own car next to it. As she walked into the office, she saw Otley. I hear you've got a suspect, she said. Yeah. We arrested him yesterday. His DNA matches the killer's. Otley spoke sharply to Tennyson. Like his boss, he did not enjoy talking to her. He hated ambitious women. Later that morning, Tennyson went to see her boss, Chief Inspector Kernan, to complain about the murder cases always being passed to male officers. If you're unhappy at this police station, you can move to another one, Kernan said. I don't want to move. I want to know why Shefford got this is when he was on holiday. He knew the victim. So did I. I knew the victim, Tennyson shouted. I arrested her two years ago. Kernan told her again that she must be patient. He was pleased when she left his office. She was a good officer, but she was a woman, and he did not like working with women. He, like Shefford and Otley, believed that crime investigation was better done by men. He would be happy when she left the station and went elsewhere. Later, Shefford also went to see Kernan. It looks good, John, Kernan said. Are you okay? You don't look too good. Just tired, Shefford replied. We've been working on this case all day and all night. We need more evidence. But there's blood on Marlowe's coat. If that matches Della's blood type, we've got him. As he spoke, Shefford felt a strong pain in his chest. Kernan looked at him. What's the matter? I don't know. I've got a pain. Shefford couldn't breathe. The pain got worse. Suddenly he fell, hitting his head on the corner of Kernan's desk. Kernan telephoned for a doctor. Otley tried to help his boss stand up, but Shefford could not move. His eyes were closed. Tennyson heard somebody shouting outside her office. A doctor ran past. What is it? she asked. Shefford's ill. Shefford's heart failed, and he died before the ambulance reached the hospital. Tennyson sat in her office. She did not like Shefford, but she was sorry he was dead. And now, somebody else would have to lead the Della Mornay case. Kernan called his boss, Jeff Trainer, to discuss the situation. Somebody must take over the Della Mornay case, and although neither man liked Tennyson, they knew she was waiting. The men won't want to work for her, Kernan said. But who else can we use? None of the other senior officers are available. Right. Put her in charge of the case. Trainer said, but watch her carefully. If she does anything wrong, we'll get rid of her. Chapter 3 Tennyson Takes Over Otley was the last person to arrive at the meeting. All the police officers in the room were silent. They had admired their boss, and now Shefford was dead. 
Kernan stood up and began to speak. I've looked at the Marlowe case, and I think we can charge him with Della Mornay's murder. I'm bringing in another senior officer to take over the case. You all know Chief Detective Tennyson. There was a shout of protest from the men. Otley stepped forward. I'm sorry, sir, but you can't let her take over. We don't want her. We've worked as a team for five years. Bring in someone we know. She's the only officer available, Kernan said, and she's taking over the case. There's nothing more to discuss. He left the room quickly before there were any more protests. Tennyson was going to have trouble working with these men. Otley emptied everything out of John Shefford's desk. His eyes filled with tears as he looked at the photographs of Shefford's family. He was still sitting at the desk when Birkin came in. Tennyson's checking through the evidence. Do you want to speak to her? I don't even want to be in the same room as her, Otley said. Tennyson read all the reports on the Della Mornay case. Then she and Detective Jones went to see Mrs. Salbana at the house in Milner Road. The woman couldn't tell her anything. She didn't pay her rent, she complained. When will you police finish looking at her room? I could rent it to someone else. I need the money. You saw the body, Tennyson said. Are you certain it was Della Mornay? Who else could it be? Mrs. Salbana asked. How well did you know Della? I didn't know her. I rented a room to her. I didn't see her often, only when I collected the rent, and she was always late paying that. Tennyson looked around Della's room. There were still some clothes and shoes in the cupboard. She looked carefully at the shoes. Next, Tennyson went to look at Della Mornay's body. Someone had cleaned her and combed her hair, but the deep cuts on her face were still there. Tennyson looked at the marks on Della's arms. She was tied by the top of her arms and her wrists, the doctor said, and there's a small cut on her hand. Where? The doctor showed her a small cut on the girl's wrist. It was quite deep, so it must have bled a lot. Tennyson nodded and turned to Jones. We arrested Della before, so we must have a copy of her fingerprints. Check them with the fingerprints from the body. We've already done that, Jones said. Well, do it again, now. That night... As Peter watched television, Jane Tennyson continued reading her notes on the case. She looked very tired. Come to bed, Jane, Peter said. Soon. I want to finish this. Peter went to bed. Jane did not come with him. She worked all through the night and fell asleep sitting at her desk. At nine o'clock, when Tennyson entered the meeting room, all the officers were silent. They didn't try to hide how much they disliked her. You know that I am now in charge of this case. I'm sorry about Shefford. I know you are upset and shocked by his death. I hope that you'll cooperate with me to close the case. She looked at their faces. If any of you don't want to work with me, then you can move to another case. None of the men spoke. Otley looked at her with hatred. OK. Now, here's the bad news, she continued. This is a photograph of Della Mornay. And this is a photograph of the murder victim. Their fingerprints are not the same. Their feet are different sizes. Our victim is not Della Mornay. Somebody made a mistake. You know Shefford identified her, Otley shouted. Then he was wrong. I want to know how Marlowe knew her name. At the beginning of his first interview, 
He said he didn't know the girl. By the end of the second interview, he was calling her Della. How did he find out her name? Otley opened his mouth to interrupt, but she did not notice him. We have to start again. We have to find out who the dead girl is, and where Della Mornay is. I think Marlowe is involved in this case, but if we don't find more evidence, we can't charge him. So we need to work quickly. Nobody spoke as she walked to the door, but when she left the room, all the men started talking. I hate her," Otley said. "John Shefford only died yesterday, and she's trying to make him look like a fool." When Tennyson went to interview Marlowe, she was surprised by how handsome he was—handsome, polite, wearing an expensive suit. She introduced herself. "You know what happened to John Shefford. I'm Chief Detective Tennyson. I am now in charge of this case. I need to ask you some more questions." Marlowe repeated his story. He saw the girl near the station. And offered her money to have sex with him. Which girl, Della Mornay? You knew her then, did you? No, I didn't know her name. I'd never seen her before. Mister Shefford told me her name. Okay. Then what happened? We had sex in the back seat of my car. When she climbed out of the car, she cut her hand on the edge of the radio. I gave her my handkerchief to wrap around her hand because there was blood on her fingers. Then I took her back to the station. She got out of my car and went to another car, a red one. I suppose she found another customer. And you're sure you'd never seen her before? No, and I wish I hadn't seen her then. I was so stupid. Otley knocked on the door. And Tennyson went outside to speak to him. We've found some blood on his coat. It's the same type as the victim's. We've got him. No, we haven't. Tennyson replied. He says that the girl cut her hand in his car. That explains the blood. And Shefford told him Della's name. We haven't enough evidence to prove that he did the murder. If we went to court with this case, they would find him not guilty immediately. Tennyson interviewed Marlowe for another hour. Finally, she collected her papers together. Just one more question, Mister Marlowe. You drove home, is that right? Yes. Do you have a garage? No, I left the car outside the house. The police say they can't find it. Do you think it's been stolen? Tennyson did not reply. She was walking to the door when Marlowe stopped her. Excuse me, can I go home now? No, I'm sorry, Mister Marlowe, but you can't. Otley was sitting in the meeting room talking to Birkin when Tennyson walked in with a big, dark-haired man. This is Detective Tony Muddyman. He starts work with us tomorrow. I've told him something about the case, but you can tell him the details. Muddyman knew some of the officers, and they greeted him. Otley was not sure about him. He did not want any friends of Tennyson's working on the team. Tennyson picked up a piece of paper from Otley's desk. Are these the names of girls who've been reported missing? Yeah, it says missing persons report on the top of it. Cut it out, Otley, Tennyson said sharply. She looked at the list. One in Brighton, one in Surrey, one here in London. I'll visit them. She reached for the telephone as it rang. It was Peter. She turned away from the men in the room as she talked to him. I'm sorry, I can't talk now. Is it important? Birkin came into the room looking for her. We're ready to search Marlowe's house again, he said. Tennyson promised to call Peter back later. She put the telephone down and went to join Birkin. "We're looking for a handkerchief," she said. 
one with blood on it. Tennyson and Birkin knocked on the door of Marlowe's house. They waited a long time before the door was pulled open. Moira Henson stood there. Tennyson looked carefully at her. It was the first time she had seen Marlowe's wife. She knew Moira was thirty-eight, but she looked older. She wore expensive clothes and a lot of makeup. Yes, she asked. I'm Chief Detective Tennyson. So what? Tennyson noted the good jewelry which Moira wore, expensive bracelets, lots of rings. Her nails were long and red. We want to search this house. We have the necessary papers. I'd like to ask you a few questions while Detective Birkin looks around. I don't have much choice, do I? Moira said as she let them in. The house was tidy and well decorated. This is very nice, Tennyson said. What did you expect? George works hard. He earns plenty of money. Have you found his car yet? It's your fault. It's gone. Somebody will have seen you take him away and stolen the car. I can't give you any information about the car. I just want to have a chat with you. I've taken over the investigation. The other inspector died suddenly. Good. The fewer police, the better. How do you feel about your husband picking up a prostitute, Moira? Tennyson asked. Wonderful. How do you think I feel? What about the girl he attacked before he went to prison? He didn't do anything. That woman was crazy. Maybe George had too much to drink, but he didn't attack her. Was he drunk when he came home on Saturday night? No, he was not. And what time did he arrive home? Half past ten. We watched television and we went to bed. Tennyson took a photograph from her bag and showed it to Moira. This is the girl he admits he had sex with. Look at her. So what? I'm sorry the girl's dead, but what do you expect me to do about it? Plenty of men have sex with other women. One more question, Moira. Did you know Della Mornay? I've never heard of her. Never? No. And you're certain George didn't know her? Moira folded her arms across her chest. I've never heard of her. Tennyson put the photograph back in her bag. Thank you for your time, she said. As they left the house, Birkin told her that he had not found any handkerchief with blood on it. Otley and Jones searched through a list of all the girls who had been reported missing in London during the last month. Then they began visiting their homes. One of them could be the murder victim. The first apartment they visited was in a good neighbourhood, but the apartment itself was untidy and dirty. A tall, blonde-haired girl opened the door. My friend Karen has been missing for about two weeks. Nobody has seen her. I thought she was staying with her boyfriend, but she isn't. Do you have a photograph of her? Otley asked. When he looked at the photograph of the pretty young girl, he knew immediately he had found the name of the murder victim. Tennyson and Birkin visited two other families who had reported missing daughters. Neither of them was anything like the murdered girl. Otley has done this on purpose. He knew these couldn't be the girls. He's trying to make me look stupid, she thought. As they drove back to London, Tennyson asked Birkin, What do you think of Marlowe? Birkin answered slowly. I think he did it. There's something about him. I don't know what, but I think he's our man. Tennyson stared out of the car window, talking more to herself than to Birkin. You know, being a woman in my position isn't easy. I have feelings about people, but they're probably different to yours. As a man, you feel that Marlowe did it. Why? Why do you think it's him? He had sex with her, 
We know that. That doesn't make him the murderer. We have to find the links, the connections. His wife supports him. He's been in trouble before, but she still supports him. I still think it's him, Birkin said. You can't charge a man because you think he's guilty. You have to have evidence. At that moment, a message came over the radio. The officers had searched every inch of Della's flat. There was no evidence to show that Marlowe had ever been there, not a single hair. Tennyson leaned back in her seat. How did he get in there and walk away without leaving anything behind? The third house they visited belonged to a rich family. The door was opened by a man. Major Howard, I'm Chief Detective Tennyson, and this is Detective Birkin. We want to ask you some questions about your daughter. He let them into the house. Of course. Do come in. He led them into a large room with big windows which looked out onto the garden. The elderly man turned to them. Please sit down. What can I do for you? Is something wrong? We're looking for your daughter. Nobody has seen her for two weeks. What? Is this a joke? The man looked upset, but Tennyson kept on questioning him. Do you have a photograph of your daughter? When the Major showed her a photograph, Tennyson knew immediately who it was. I'm sorry, sir, she said. I have to tell you that I think your daughter is dead. Otley and Jones spent the rest of the afternoon interviewing prostitutes. None of them could remember when they last saw Della. These women make me angry. Otley said. We should get rid of them all. They'll do anything for money. Jones did not reply. My wife, Otley went on, was a good woman. She never hurt anybody, and she died. Why did she have to die? Why not one of these women? Tennyson led Major Howard into the room where the body was lying. Are you ready? she asked him. He nodded. She pulled back the blanket which covered the body. Major Howard, is this your daughter, Karen Julia Howard? He stared at the dead girl. Tennyson waited. After a long time, he nodded. Yes, this is my daughter. There were many questions which Tennyson wanted to ask him, but he spoke first. How did she die? How long has she been here? Why wasn't I told before? Who is in charge of this investigation? Tennyson interrupted. I'm in charge. You. Let me speak to Commander Trainer. He's a friend of mine. I will not have a woman in charge. Let me see the commander. Tennyson opened her mouth to reply, but Birkin stopped her. Leave him alone, he said. He's upset. I have many friends, the major shouted. I know many people who could lead this investigation. Then he began to cry like a small child. Tennyson was ashamed of herself for wanting to question him. She left the Major and Birkin together. The young police officer put his arm across the older man's shoulders as he kept on crying. <laughs>